Hello and welcome to the Auto X Show. Now sit tight and don't go anywhere because on the show today we've got BMW's brand new flagship, the X7. And Jared has a really busy week on a couple of motorcycles. The Royal Enfield Bullet Trials 500 and the Triumph Street Scrambler. But first, here's the very big, very luxurious and very toothy BMW X7. Hello and welcome from Death Valley in the United States of America. I come to you from Death Valley because this is a proper dose of Americana straight from Bavaria. Well, actually these cars are built in South Carolina, but you get my drift. Why a dose of Americana? Well, just look at that nose. That is the elephant in the room. This is the brand new BMW X7. The X range of vehicles now stretches all the way from the X1 to this, the brand new flagship, the X7. This is the biggest vehicle that BMW makes. It is over five meters in length, three meters within the wheelbase alone. You could fit a small car between the front and rear seats of this massive machine. Why is it so big and why are we in the US? Well, because BMW thinks that this is exactly what they need to take on the Mercedes-Benz GLS and the Range Rover. They need a car that is distinctive, that is in your face, that is big, massive and imposing. And that's exactly what this is. Now, if you ask me, I think it looks fantastic. Well, other than that nose. It looks like the BMW designers did a phenomenal job with this machine and then hired a caricature artist to come in and sketch that nose. But hey, what do I know about aesthetics? Look at me. It's a personal choice after all. As far as BMW is concerned, they think it's better for a car to be distinctive, to make you give it that second look, to really stand out. That's what their customers want. That's what their customers want in the US and in China, which is gonna be the biggest markets for this machine. In India, well, that's up to you. I'm here to find out if this huge, massive machine from BMW drives like a proper BMW from behind the wheel. So I'm gonna get in and try my hand in this car around the mountains of Death Valley to see if it drives like a proper BMW. So when I'm reviewing a BMW, the last place you'll typically find me is in the rear seat. But the reason for existence of this machine is the comfort that it provides you in the rear seat. The reason it's five meters long and three meters within the wheelbase is because of this. Because of this ultra luxurious cabin and the amount of space that you have inside the cabin. This is a really comfortable rear seat. It's got the cushioning in all the right places. It's got plenty of leg room. There's a third row behind me as well, which is standard, and that has plenty of space as well, believe it or not, even for two full-size adults. There's a third row now in an optional third row in the X5 as well, but it's really tight. I mean, you would punish somebody if you put somebody back there. And I love the X5 to bits. I think it's the best SUV that you can drive today, but if you're sitting in the back, it is a little bit tight. And that's where the X7 comes in. This thing has acres of space acres of comfort, acres of luxury. The reason this car exists is because most of you are going to be sitting here and enjoying the comforts of the rear seat. So, rear seat comfort is all very well, but when you're testing a BMW, this is where you want to be. This is where it all goes down. Now, the cabin is actually quite familiar. We recently drove the brand new BMW 3 Series and a lot of the bits here are actually pretty familiar as a result. I'm sitting facing two 12.3 inch screens. You've got BMW's new instrument cluster, which has the gauges in the two corners, which frees up the space in the center for a bunch of information. At the moment, we're relying on it for navigation. I've got a head-up display, which is multicolor and gives me a bunch of information as well. There's another 12.3 inch screen here, which is a big, massive wide screen, and it allows you to control BMW's latest iDrive system. And like the 3 Series, it's got BMW's intelligent personal assistant. So it's got a few tricks up its sleeve. Hey, Bob's uncle, I'm bored. I can imagine that. Maybe you didn't get a chance to try out sport mode. Oh. Hmm. 
So, X7 has sport mode as well. What could possibly be better? Of course, there are a couple of nice touches in this cabin as well. You've got BMW's new sort of crystal gear lever, which adds a little bit of panache, although I'm not so sure. Um, the fit and finish is fantastic. You've got the new sort of cabin layout, which is very sleek, very horizontal, and the quality levels, as you would imagine, in a car like this, are fantastic. It's all about comfort. And this seat, like the rear seat, holds you in just the right places. This is the perfect car in which to cross continents or in this case, to cross the Death Valley. So let's get going and see how she behaves on the move. I've got sport mode after all. So we are finally on the move and a couple of things I should probably explain. You probably heard me say, hey Bob, set the car to so-and-so. Now, this is your own personal assistant. So presumably, you can name it what you want. So it's called your personal activation word. And I named my personal activation word, Bob's my uncle. So you can name it Bob's your uncle, or you can name it Galadria, who's an elven queen, or you can name it whatever you want. But enough about the gizmos for a minute. Let's talk about how this car feels when you're finally on the move. Bear in mind that as massive as this car is, and the fact that it weighs 2.3 tons. So it really is huge. But we were having dinner yesterday with the driving dynamics engineer. And he told me something which I almost virtually couldn't believe. He said that this car goes around the Nürburgring Nordschleife, which every single BMW is tested on. It's known as the Green Hell because it is the most testing piece of tarmac on the planet. It is the absolute litmus test for any vehicle that has ever been made. And this, according to him, the 50i version, which is the V8 petrol, will go around the Nürburgring Nordschleife in the same lap time as what a 10-year-old BMW M3 would do. That's roughly in the eight-minute mark, which for a car of this size and this weight and this dimensions is just absolutely staggering. Of course, he said they've gone through huge, huge lengths to make this car handle and feel like a proper BMW from behind the wheel. He was explaining to us that the steering rack is, is cradled in four springs of four different configurations. My uneducated, un non-engineering brain could just about fathom what he was saying. Suffice to say that they've done a lot of work to make sure that this car feels light and lit and not heavy and lumbering from behind the wheel. What I can tell you from initial impressions is that it really does feel pretty good from behind the wheel. The 7 Series, BMW's erstwhile flagship or their sedan flagship, um, is uh, the sportiest luxury sedan that you can buy. It feels like a car that you can chuck around um, and it's comfortable and luxurious at the same time. And those are the same sort of characteristics that this car should possess. Initial impressions, uh, that it feels really quite responsive from behind the wheel. Now, these big massive luxury SUVs are the perfect vehicles in which to cross continents. I've, had the, uh, I've been fortunate enough to drive a Mercedes-Benz GL, now the GLS, around, well, across the US, as well as all the way through Central America. And what I can tell you is that there is no vehicle that is as comfortable, as capable, and as capable of carrying people and luggage and crew and stuff across continents as these big SUVs. So this car has to succeed on both fronts. It has to be able to uh, carry people and luggage and be luxurious and comfortable, and it has to drive like a BMW. The beauty of a Range Rover or a GLS is that they can waft you from place to place. A Range Rover just has this seamless uh, sort of fluidity and uh, that's something that BMW has to retain while keeping the driving dynamics intact which is what you would expect from a BMW. Now that's tricky. This car has uh, M differential at the back. It's got just huge massive 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 tires. The rears are 315, 35, 22s. I mean that's a wider rear tire than a Porsche 911. The disadvantage of that is that uh, because the tires are so big and because the tread, lo tread blocks are so massive, it tends to sort of follow every crevice uh, in the road. It tends to respond to all the changes in the road surface. And that's not necessarily what you want 
from a luxury SUV. It is what you want from a car that is responsive, but maybe not one in this segment. So there are trade-offs both ways. The cars that come to India, of course, won't have 22-inch wheels. They'll probably have the standard 20-inch wheels, um, as a result of which they'll probably ride a little bit better. But because this car is so big, it looks proportionate on 22-inch rims, and the 20s might look a little bit small. We'll get three models that will come to India. You'll have the 50D, which is a 3-liter turbo diesel, which produces just short of 400 horsepower and does 0 to 100 in 5.4 seconds. There'll be the 40i, which is what we're driving right now, which is a 3-liter turbocharged petrol engine that produces 340 horsepower and does 0 to 100 in 6.1 seconds. And you've got the 30D, which is the 3-liter turbo diesel that produces 265 horsepower and does 0 to 100 in 7.1 seconds. So the 50D in M Sport spec is being imported into India as a CBU. So it'll be a fully built-up unit, which will be really, really pricey. These two, the 40i and the 30D, will be assembled in the country, but expect those to be well north of a crore as well. That is, after all, the segment in which this machine is playing. As far as BMW is concerned, they've ticked off a big box in their range. This was a car that has been a long time coming. And, and just after I finished telling you that I thought the front grille was designed by somebody who's a caricature artist, someone came up to me and said, hey, how about that car? Doesn't it look fantastic? I said, really? And uh, what about the front grille? And he said, I absolutely love it. So, different strokes for different folks. Whatever floats your boat. Who am I or anyone else to tell you whether something looks good or not? It's completely a personal preference. I just wish BMW made two versions of the X7. One with in-your-face styling like this one, and another one with slightly more subtle styling for people that don't want such an imposing front grill. This is a car for people who really want to make a statement. When you're barreling down the highway, if I saw this in my rearview mirror, I for one would get out of the way very, very quickly. If that's what floats your boat, the X7 coming your way very shortly. As for how this car will behave in Indian spec when it's launched in India later this year, well, we'll just have to wait and see. The CBUs will be on the road in about six months time and the 40i and the 30d will come your way sometime towards the end of the year. So stay tuned. Once we get these in India, we'll take it out for a spin and tell you how they behave in our conditions. Right, now don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Jared checks out a bullet with a difference. Welcome back to the AutoX Show. Now, Royal Enfield has got a lot of acclaim for the 650cc twins that they launched recently. But let's not forget the bullet that got them to where they are today. Here's a rather special one. So it's only been a couple of months since Royal Enfield launched the much-awaited GT and Interceptor uh, 650 twins. Both motorcycles were very nice, we were very impressed. And it's actually a very big step up for Royal Enfield to launch those bikes in terms of quality, engine performance and looks. What we have right now today is the new Royal Enfield Bullet Trials model. Uh, what is a trials model? Well. Back in the 30s and 40s, Royal Enfield took part in trials competition. Now what that was, was a race set over a couple of days where riders would ride over obstacles in different courses. Now you were judged on how well you balanced the bike and how well you controlled the throttle because you weren't allowed to keep your feet on the ground at any point. In fact, if you did touch your foot to the ground, it was called a dab. And so that was what trial competition was all about. Today, trials competition has progressed a lot more where you have it in indoor stadiums on much more lighter bikes that go over barrels and wood logs and such. But today, Royal Enfield has invited us here to Ambi Valley in, uh, in Lunavla, and we've got the Royal Enfield Bullet 500 trials version with us right here. Now, interestingly enough, this uh, version we have is the fully accessorized version. And so what that means is it's got a lot of accessories on it that do not come on the stock motorcycle. 
So I'm just gonna walk around here and explain to you what all this bike comes with. First off, the stock version of this motorbike is basically uh, paying tribute to the heritage of the Trials version bike of Enfield that won a lot of competitions back in the 40s and 50s, okay? So what they've done essentially is they've, they've made a new subframe at the back here, as you can see, and they've colored the entire chassis and frame in a green color. Uh, they've got a nice little uh, luggage uh, carrier here at the back, so there will be no rear seat available on this motorcycle. And they've also raised the rear mudguard as well. Then, of course, you have the upswept exhaust at the back here, which gives it that Trous version kind of uh, look. But although I would have preferred to have this exhaust come out somewhere in the middle uh, to give it that nicer um, heritage look. And then uh, you've got these uh, handlebars and you've got this padding up here. Now, the accessories that come on this motorcycle are obviously the sump guard, which you've got there. You've got the engine guard. Well, on the other side, you can't see, but and you've got the number badging. Uh, which pays tribute to one of their racers and you've got the padding on the handlebar here and you've got the headlight protection as well so these are all accessories and they will charge a lot more i would say probably 15,000 rupees more than what the stock version of this bike will cost you um so yeah we've actually been riding this motorcycle now on different trial stages uh royal enfield has invited us and they've had a, like a mini competition for trials for all of us first impressions are that the bike uh, rides exactly like a bullet as you would expect the engine specifications are exactly the same, the frame is the same, the seating position is the same, the handlebar is the same, the ground clearance is the same, suspension travel is the same. So essentially it's a Bullet 500, uh, handles the way it does, very um, heavy and heavy steering. But uh, what they've done with this version, they've got uh, specially designed tires for these uh, knobby tires and they've got spokes obviously. But like I said before, this is a bullet. So bullets have been known to be very tough, uh, very reliable vehicles when you're going to be going on the rough stuff. Overall, very good performance, I would say, for someone who uh, likes uh, trial riding or likes to go on the, the rough stuff. It's definitely not fast, of course. The acceleration is not the greatest. It's got a nice torque output, but it's not the best. And the throttle response is a little lazy as well. So it's essentially basically a bullet. Nothing new in terms of riding enhancements or anything like that. The overall design, again, of these motorcycles is so ancient. Uh, you would have expected the rear brake lever to have been modified in some way because it sticks out at the bottom right under the exhaust and always hits on rocks and stuff when you're riding. So yeah, overall, the, this nice spring suspension does a pretty good job and the front suspension also does a pretty decent job of soaking up stuff. But uh, this is basically a bike uh, that is going to be appealing to the people who like uh, the look of the bike. It doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not much different from the Bullet 500. You could easily customize your own Bullet 500 and get your own tires and, you know, set it up to how you like it. Still, I mean, if you just want to get out there and buy yourself a nice trial looking motorcycle, this is a great option. Uh, this is the 500. It starts at about 2 lakh 7,000 rupees ex showroom Delhi. The 350cc uh, version is about 1 lakh 64,000 ex showroom. So you're getting pretty much a trial kit for the Bullet 500. Um, but once again, uh, Royal Enfield, you know, after we've ridden the, the 650 twins, we really were impressed with the quality and how the improvements have been made to Royal Enfield. But when you come back to these motorbikes, they're older motorbikes, the quality issues are definitely still there. There is nothing out there like this. You've got a little bit more premium bikes like the Scrambler Ducati and of course the, the Triumph uh, Street Twin Scrambler that are more or less the same type of motorcycle like this. This is a little bit cheaper than those, obviously. This is a niche product. I don't think a lot of guys would go for this, but it looks very nice in terms of design and it does stand out. So yeah, it's a great option depending on what you're going for. But if uh, you're gonna spend two lakh rupees on a bike like this, there are a lot of other options out there for you to look into. This is obviously a Royal Enfield. It's gonna have a lot of hype coming into the market. Uh, it does look very nice. So if you like trial riding and if you like heritage motorcycles, well, this is actually a great option for you. Um, for two lakh rupees, I mean, there's a lot better stuff out there in the market, but this is going to appeal to a certain group of people, as we know. So yeah, this is the review of the 500 trials. Uh, head to your nearest Enfield dealership and take it for a test spin. Now sit tight, because when we come back, Jared gets on the saddle of another very unique motorcycle. Welcome back to the AutoX Show. 
Now Triumph has just upgraded their best-selling model lineup, the Street Twin. Here's the Street Scrambler, the more interesting and more powerful of this brand new duo. So British manufacturer Triumph has just completed five years here in India and they've been very successful and that's because they've offered a wide range of products. They have a very vast product portfolio offering to all kinds of riders. The newest products we have here are the Street Twin. Now the Street Twin is their best selling model here in India and globally and that's because it's affordable, it's easy to ride and it looks very very good. Today we've got with us the Street Scrambler and that's because the Street Twin is a little too boring for us. And that's why I'm geared up here in my off-road gear because we're going to ride this bike and see if more power and more refinement actually makes a better twin. So there have been a few design changes to the new bikes. What we have right here is the Scrambler version of the Street Twin. And obviously this has got a lot of accessories on it. What this bike has is the Vance & Heinz uh, exhaust and the protection up here for the head plate. These are accessories of course. What this bike gets is a new seat, a new fuel tank, it's got knee guards as well. It gets a bash plate, it gets a mid-mounted exhaust. Um, it's also got rubber mounts on the, the handlebar. This handlebar is also now wider and it's higher, offering a better riding position. And even the seat is in the Scrambler is higher than the Street Twin. So the Street Scrambler also gets a new Metzeler Dobby tires. It also gets a 19 inch front rim and a 17 inch at the back. It also gets new KYB uh, forks and it also gets Brembo brakes. Now the engine remains more or less the same but they have retuned it and they have added a few additional parts. It's the same 900cc twin cylinder engine. It's a very high torque engine. This one gets additional horsepower. It's been bumped up by 10 bhp so it now gets 65 brake horsepower and it also comes at 500 rpm higher. Uh, the torque remains the same at 80 newton meters of torque. Uh, but the curve has been flattened, which means you get a much better spread uh, of torque throughout the rev counter. So one of the main reasons why the Street Twins have been very uh, good sellers for Triumph is because they are very easy to ride motorcycles. They're small, they're compact and they're very light. So any kind of rider can actually get on this bike. I'm very tall and I'm very heavy and still the bike is very manageable for me, very comfortable and I can ride for days on end without feeling discomfort whatsoever. The new Street Scrambler we have with us today more or less has the same ergonomics. It's a very comfortable machine, it's very light and it is off-road centric of course. So you've got the wider handlebars, it's also higher, uh, the seat is also much higher than the regular Street Twin. So it's more tuned to off-road riding when you want to go on the rough stuff. Uh, but more or less this bike behaves very well even when you're on tarmac. Uh, it's not as fun to ride as the Street Twin, of course, because that has more character than this when you're on tarmac. And this also is not a very hardcore off-roader. This is more of a tamed off-roader. Uh, number one is the ground clearance. It's very low, so you will be hitting rocks and stones and whatever comes in your way. But more or less, this is very easy to ride. It's fun to ride when it wants to be. Uh, you've got three different riding modes. You've got rain, you've got road, and you've also got an off-road mode here which puts off the traction control and the ABS and you can change that back on the fly when you decide to go back on the tarmac. But overall, riding dynamics are very nice for this bike. Um, once again, it's not the most exciting, it's not the most thrilling, but it does you know, inspire lots of confidence because it's so easy to handle. Steering is very light and in my honest opinion, I would think that you know, the Scrambler would be a much better option to own, especially if you're living in urban areas in India where the roads are not the best. Uh, the Scrambler is much better than the Street Twin in terms of the way it rides and feels. And the Scrambler also gets a little higher uh, torque rating in the revs. But more or less, this is a very nice bike which can be used in all riding conditions. It's not an extreme and it's not too soft. It's right there in the middle, which makes it a very fun bike. And the only problem is that it's expensive. This bike here comes at around uh, 9 lakh ex showroom Delhi whereas the, the Street Twin base model comes around 7.5 lakh. If you want to opt for something else, there is now the new Royal Enfield Interceptor and Continental GT, which is also a twin cylinder engine 650cc and is actually a competitor to this motorcycle. And best of all, it costs 5 lakh less and it offers just the same amounts of fun as you would on this. This of course is more premium. Um, it's got a Triumph badge on it, so you know it does stand out a little bit more. 
but in terms of riding dynamics, um, you don't really need so much power, especially when riding in India. Uh, the new Royal Enfield Interceptor is a great bike and it can handle, you know, any kind of road surface here in India. It's also comfortable. But, you know, if it's a scrambler you want and you don't want to hit the rough stuff too often, then this street scrambler is the perfect bike for you. However, if you're interested in more intense off-roading and you want a proper scrambler that can go on any road surface, I have to say that the Scrambler Ducati Desert Sled is one of my favorite scramblers right now. No other bike offers you greater riding pleasure. Still though, the Strive is a great bike, no doubt. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on social media for your daily dose of all things automotive. And remember, it's chaos out there. So always buckle up and wear your helmets. We'll see you again next weekend on the AutoX Show.